Okay. Next volume coming up. Page 138. Of Shabbos. Perikestrim. Tolin. What was Tolin again? Do you recall? Is that hanging or something? Yes, uh, yes. It's uh, suspension. Suspending. Ah, brilliant. Ela Maravaye. Mid Rabbanan here. It is rabbinically, meaning it's rabbinically prohibited to suspend the strainer. So that one should not act in the manner in which he acts during the week. Good point. Man matniyata vetane collected and group rulings in Baraisas and taught them as follows. It's in relation to construction of a tent on Shabbat. Hagod ve hameshamere kila ve chise galin a leather bag, a strainer, a canopy, and a chair of galin. Does that accord with what you've got, Peter? Um, what we've got is a large wine skin, a wine strainer, a canopy hung over a bed, and a folding chair whose cover is detached from its legs. What did you say a chair of gullin is? A folding chair. A folding chair. Yeah. With a cover which is detached from its legs. Law ya'ase. One should not make them on Shabbos Yomtev. Vima sapatura valasur. And if one did make them, he is exempt. Although it is rabbinically prohibited. Ohalei keva loya say one should not make permanent make a permanent tent on Shabbos Yom Tov. But imasa chayav chatat. And if you did the did that, you're liable for a chatat. Aval mita vechiset traskal vaasla a bed or a folding chair or a folding toilet seat. Do you have all that? Yeah. Yep. A bed, a folding chair, or a folding toilet seat. Who has a collapsible toilet? A collapsible toilet. Mutar lin totan lechat chila. It's per- permitted to spread them out even ab initio. Yes. The ein notnin la luya be Shabbat. The sages say we may not. Okay, so that, that's a full stop there. There's, um, in relation to what you call the toilet seat, the people collapse the toilet, it was typically a metal frame over which they would stretch out a leather hide with a pole. So, so was, what's the point of the picture? It's different that's entirely. Different. That's different. It's just showing the Roman rules. So it's the Talmudic time. So it's a frame with a leather skin, with a hole oh, in it. I assume, you know, I mean, you... It's a dunny seat. Yeah, it's a dunny seat. You've got a big hole and you've filled it in so that you can sit there without fear of falling in and you pull through the hole. That's clever. Uh, so the mission continues... It's hot weather. It's hot weather. You can wear it on your head. It's a shame you... <laughs> <That's just fantastic. laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of a musical I saw once. The A not not nin la pluya Shabbat. So the Mishnah said we may not pour into a suspended strainer on Shabbat. Right. That was to get the dregs out or whatever. Mm. Ibailahu, they inquired, Shimer Mai, if one strained, what's the law? Amarav Kahana, Shimer Chayav Khatat, you're liable for a Khatat. Matkifla Rav Sheshet, so Rav Sheshet challenged this. 
Mi ikka mi di the Rabbana Mechaive Chatas. Is there any case in which the rabbis would hold someone liable to a chatat offering? The Rabbi Eliezer, Sharei Lechatchila. While Rabbi Eliezer would allow even ab initio. The problem, as I understand it at this point, is that you've got Rav Sheshet um, applying a chatat offering to what looks like a rabbinic law, which isn't allowed. You, you can, it has to be Torah law, but you're, you've, uh, of course, overridden. And Rav Sheshet yeah. is saying, well... It's a chatar offering. Um, sorry, and the blue. And Rabbi Eliezer is saying... It's not. It's not, and you can do it. Right. And then you can... What you come up to against is the rabbis who come up with a, a third position. Which we haven't got to yet. Which we will get to soon. Yeah. Matif la Rav Yosef. So Rav Yosef challenged the assertion. Al malo. Sorry, al malo. But why not? And then he goes on. Don't leave it at why not. Don't leave, leave it at one. Okay. Hare ir shel zahav. There is uh, a city of gold. Remember the head head decorations. The, the women that we have discussed. The very rich women wore head decorations. Right, an ornament. Yeah. Ah, that's right. It was called the city of gold. Very, very nice. The Rabbi Meir mechayev chatat, in which Rabbi Meir holds woman is liable to a chatat for wearing it in a public area. The Rabbi Elias says, Sharei lechachila, Rabbi Elias allows it in the first place. And so therefore he permits it. Mayhi, and what is that case? Ditanya. Lo tetei shabe ir shel zahav, women may not go out while wearing a city of gold. The im yata, chayevet chatat, and if she went out, she's liable to a chatat. Divrei Rabbi Meir, these are the words of Rabbi Meir. The Chachamim Omrim, Lotete, she may not go out. The Im Yatsa and if she did go out, she's exempt from a Chatat offering. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Yotsa Isha Be'ir Shel Zahav Lechachila, she can, right in the beginning, she can go out. At the outset, she can go out with it, completely permitted. And so we have. Apparently, the, the gist of the argument is that. Um, who was the first one who said she couldn't do it at all? And then they think, Rabbi Meir, and she's liable to bring a sin off thing. Right. He's saying that what she's doing is carrying, and therefore it's not allowed, and she has to bring a sin off thing. That sounds reasonable. The rabbis say that. Effectively, she shouldn't go out with them. But it's not she did. She doesn't have to do it. Why? Apparently, the rabbi's view was that it's a week it's not carrying. Her. It's not carrying. But it might turn into carrying. If she wears this ornament out, she right. goes and meets a friend. Right. She will... Take it off, show it off to her, yeah. and they'll walk along for a month, discussing yeah. it. That was the big, uh, the big ending to that. That mm. uh, that's why they never allowed any of those things. And Rabbi Eliezer says no. Something else is happening. There's no biblical prohibition. Right. She can wear it. Right. And people of this status, people who can wear these sorts of ornaments. Yeah are not going to go around taking them off to show their friends. They're just going to wear it. And there's no risk at all of her taking it off and showing it off and carrying it. Mm. Therefore, from his point of view, um, there's no biblical prohibition and there's no likelihood of any other sort of uh, carrying. carrying. So there's no problem. The rabbis say, ah, look, it's always possible that someone might take it off their head. So... Let's bring that. And the extreme person, 
the one who is sort of out in effect. Eliezer and the rabbis agree on what the basic halacha is. This is not a breach of Torah law. And there's only one person who thinks it's a breach of Torah law. Okay, so now we're going to find something distinguishing between... That's not original. I owe it to the discussion this morning. (laughs) It wasn't this morning. Good. Amale Abaye. So Abaye said to Rabbi Yosef about the city of gold. Misavrat Rabbi Elias has the Rabbi Meir Ka'e Damar Hayevet Chatat. Do you think Rabbi Elias was addressing Rabbi Meir who held she'll be liable for a Chatat? Adrabanan Kai, he was addressing the sages. Damre Patura Valasur, who say that one is exempt. But, obviously, rabbinically prohibited. Bamalehu Yehu Mit Mutalacha Hilan, Rabbi Leza said to the sages, it is permitted in the first place. Okay. It's a circular argument, like no one's going to give. They're stating, all three are stating their opinions. Well, actually, you've got two opinions that agree on the basis. There is, in wearing this thing, there is no prohibition. No prohibition. No biblical prohibition. No biblical prohibition. And on the other hand, you've got two people saying you can't do it, but not for the same reason. Mm. When Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir said you can't wear it out, he said it's because you're carrying it. Yep. And the rabbis say you're not carrying it. That's the majority of things. Okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, Stroyman, which is a magnificent thing, that someone might want to take off your head and throw it on Shabbat while you're in the street. <laughs> I mean, it's unlikely, but it's always possible. You know, it's really fun. If it's a bit better. Anyway, wait on, we get into head covering. Mishur my matri nan be, on account of which can we warn a person uh, about straining? Rabbi Amar Mishum Borer, on account of selecting. Rabbi Zay Rama Mishum Miraked, he said on account of sifting. Okay, so they're the two of Malathas that it might be breaking. Amar Rabbi, Kavati Dizi Mistabra, my opinion is the more reasonable one. Oh, of course. <laughs> Just as the normal manner of selecting is where we take food and leave the undesired matter behind. So too, where we take the food and leave the undesired matter behind. Right. Ama Rabbi Zera, Kavati Didi Mistabra, my opinion is more reasonable. Madar Koshel Meraked, Pesolot Mil Malavecha Mil Mata. Just as the normal manner of sifting is the undesired matter is on top of the food falls below, Aha Hanami Pesolot Mil Malavecha Mil Mata. So to hear, uh, the undesired matter is on top of the food, wine is below. I'd have to go with that one, Peter. I think the thing. Uh thing with sifting, though, mm. is that sifting is done with dry material. Sifting you do with flour. Um, we're just talking about liquids. Okay, so you can't... And I, I think that there's a, a core difference there. So I think straining is closer to what's going on. Rabbi Zera notes, can I read this? Okay. <coughs> Rabbi Zera, who's the one who said about sifting, notes that there is a very basic distinction between sifting and selecting. In sifting, the inedible portions of the food remain above the tool, used for sifting while the edible portions fall below. In selecting, the edible portions of the food remain above while the inedible portions fall through below. Yes, and he's perfectly right. Mm. Rashi notes that this is True in the prototypical case of selecting, which is the removal of refuse, of refuse from leakage. And since filtering wine results in the dregs of the wine remaining above, 
in the strain, it can fall only under the malacca of sifting. Accordingly, sifting is the malacca. If one who was warned not to sift failed to heed the warning and strained, he is exempt from punishment because he may not, he may have not taken the warning seriously due to the disparity between the warning and his action. In the Jerusalem Talmud, both of these opinions are rejected. The opinion of Rav Sheshet that there is a separate rabbinic prohibition applicable to straining is adopted. So the question seems to be partly whether straining and sifting are the same thing mm. or not. Sorry, I was thinking that selecting and sifting mm. could also be viewed as being so similar mm. that remember how it always talks about the thirty the forty minus one? Yeah. Because one of the arguments is that two of them are the same. Yeah. So where the this might have been a, another example of that. Yeah, maybe. The uh, funny thing about selecting but it's not here it suggests that you don't do it, but I know the halakha now is that on Shabbat you can select, providing you take the good that you need from Shabbat yeah. from the not good that you do not need from Shabbat. Yeah. And that isn't covered here, which is, I think, interesting. Maybe they don't want to get us mixed up with that. That could be. Um, okay. So, right. Tane Rami Bar Yechezkel. He taught. Talit Kfula Lo Yase. You should not make a tent from a cloak, formed by a folded cloak. How do you do that? Um, you have, well, it's just kind of states. Yeah. Or, or you have a cord suspended. And you throw the cloak over it. So that's what it means. The im asapatur aval asur. And if one did make it, you're biblically exempt, although it's rabbinically prohibited. Hayakaruch aleha chut o mishicha. If there was a string or rope tied around the cloak, a string or rope tied around the cloak. Before Shabbat. Before Shabbat. Mutar lin tota lechachila. Permitted to spread out the cloak to make the tent. Ab initio. Lechachila. So uh, what I'm visualizing here, because it's not made clear, mm. is that you've got your cloak and you've wrapped a rope around it. Mm. And you tie one side to something and tie the other side to something else using one of the permitted knots. Mm. And then you just stretch out the cloak, yeah, you know, like a curtain. You yeah, stretch it out along the length. That makes yeah, I can see that. Right. Yeah, but, yeah. No, no one's covered that's, that, but that's the only way I can see it. That's uh, that's what it says here, Peter. Oh, yeah. The army nei rav kahana merav kila mahu. What's the law of a canopy? Amalei af mita asura. Even a bed may be prohibited. So what's that making like a canvas bed or something? Yeah. Mita mahu. What's the law about setting up a bed? Amalei af kila milteret. Even a canopy may may be permitted. Yeah. Wait for the third one. Hang on. So he says canopy. Even setting up a bed is prohibited. With a bed, he said, even a canopy is permitted. Ah, okay, because for the purpose of making a bed, you're actually making a canopy, but it's still permitted because it's for the purpose of a bed. That's what it sounds like it's saying to me. Well, read on. Kila umitamahu. What's the law of a canopy and bed? Amalei. Kila asura umita muteret. Canopy is prohibited, a bed is permitted. The Lokasha. 
hard to come Arapi Tamasura, that which I've said even a bed is pe- prohibited, ki dakar manae, refers to a similar bed to those of the kamanae, which needs to be assembled. I don't know if you've ever seen the old camp beds. Well, the first time I saw one was when I came to Australia, and we had to stay at somebody else's place because there was no accommodation. And they brought out these camp beds. They were wooden frames in se- and several side beds. And you sort of put the frame apart. And you made it rigid <coughs> by putting side pieces in it. And you stretched canvas atop or across the top. Mm. And then people would lie on it and support their wide. <laughs> and they were camp beds, and they were used for camping. People didn't have sleeping beds at that time. And uh, I, I think they're talking about that sort of bed. Yeah. Which would be like making a tent, because <coughs> uh, stretching out the canvas is really, in a way, putting a, a roof over the ground. Yeah. It must be more than a hand breadth high. It says here that it's similar or the same to the Galin beds, the sectional beds. Does that, that we, make which sense? Which we couldn't use at the beginning of this. Mm. Yep, that makes sense. Um, so you can't use a bed that needs to be assembled. How does it have the canvas stretched on it, I would say? Hazakama lay of kila, af kila muteres, even a canopy may be permitted. Kid Rami Bar Yechezkel refers to a teaching of Rami Bar Yechezkel. If there was a string or rope tied around the cloak, okay. And it was fastened to the frame before Shabbos for Yom Tov. Okay, so this is the one with the string or rope tied around mm-hmm. it. Kila asura umita muteres. Canopy may be prohibited and bed permitted refers to our beds and canopies. Which do not fold, he's added. A bed of that kind involves no building. However, spreading canopies is performed in a manner similar to constructing a tent. So that's why the beds permitted the canopy isn't. Because the bed doesn't have to be unfolded, it's just the bed. But the canopy... Can't be put out. It says here, and no, sorry, go on. Go because on. Be- because you are making effectively yeah. a tent, right? and you're not using it for any other purpose. Mm. A normal bed would be pre-assembled and leaned against the wall until it was time to use it. Then it would be set down and flexed. That's what Rashi says. And that's permitted on Shabbos. Construction of a typical canopy, on the other hand, is pre- prohibited on Shabbos. There you go. You're right. Amar of Yosef. Hazina lehu lechilei deve Rav Huna. I've seen the canopies of the house of Rav Huna. Dim orta negidu umit safra chavita ramya. In in the evening, that's Shabbos Eve, Friday evening, they were spread out. While on the next morning they were thrown down. Oh, curious. Amar Rav Mishum Rav Chia. Rav said the name of Rav Chia. Vilon mutar lin toto. Mutali Proko, it can maybe hung and maybe taken down on Shabbos. This is all very interesting. So, um, this is with regard to a curtain. So, on that first one, with Ra- in Rav Huna's house, uh, that is an ohel which may be assembled on Shabbat may be disassembled as well, Well, and one which may not be assembled on Shabbat may not be disassembled. Thus, since we see that the household of Rav Huna would disassemble their canopies on Shabbat, we assume that they allowed the spreading out of such canopies as well. The Gemara does not explain why the spreading out of the canopies of Rav Huna's household was permitted. Perhaps the canopies were already in place and ropes were attached to them before Shabbat, and they were permitted because they could easily be spread out as Rami Bar Yechezkel stated above. And it says, 
the curtain may be hung and may be taken down, it says there's a screen for an entranceway. It may, may be hung and taken down on Shabbat because only roof-like structures are included in the general prohibition against mm. making a temporary tent. That is very interesting. That's very interesting. There are some... <coughs> there are some... Uh, minyanim where they put a polar and then to make the petition, the mechitza, mm. they drape the curtain over it. And then when it comes time to have the kiddish, they take the curtain off and then push the mechitza mm. pieces back. It's very curious. Case, maybe. Doing it, yeah, according to this, it would seem so. Because it's not making a canopy. No. Mm. Still. Mishum Rabbi Chia. Kilat Chatani Muta Lintota Mata Leporka. The canopy of a bridal bed may be hung and may be taken down. It has sloping sides. There's nothing. Necessarily horizontal. Ama Rav Shesha Bered Rav Idi Loam Ran Ela Shein Begagat Tefach. This is not said except where its roof, the horizontal part, is not a Tefach wide. Ah, that's interesting. So it has to go straight up and down. It can't stop that part. Yeah. Mm. Aval Yesh Begaga. Tefach asura, but if the roof is a tefach wide, it is forbidden. The chi em begaga tefach nami, and even if its roof is not a tefach wide, lo amaran ela she'en be pachot mishlosha samuch legagav tefach. This was not this ruling was not said except where uh, except where it did not amount to a tefach within. Three tefachim of the apex. So, in effect, what they're calling for is a very sharp slope. Super sharp. Mm. Oh, so it didn't come out to three so tefachim within three tefachim of the roof. Within three, three tefachim of the roof, it didn't come out to a tefach. I think. Uh, if it's a kind of width of a hamburger. Yeah, if it expands to the width right. of the handbreadth within three handbreadths of its roof, it is prohibited. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And this is his picture. Oh. This apparently is Rashi's idea of what the bridegrooms. Wow, well, Rashi. How would you call that? Like a concertina, almost. Yeah. And none of the, none of these peaks. Would be uh, more than three tefachim, mm. uh, and then uh, and the top is wouldn't be one tefach. I mean, along this ridge here, it's not one tefach wide. No, that's very interesting. Uh-huh. Um, okay, run ella she'ain be shipua. Tefach. This was not said except where there is not a tefach beneath its slope. It was not said except where there is not a tefach beneath its slope. That it sounds more like that one. Mm. Because if you apply it to this, it would mean that the bottom would be so narrow you couldn't fit in. No. A hand breadth wide. I mean, imagine lying on a bed that wide, <laughs> particularly for a bridegroom. I mean, it's to be all for the bride, apart from anything else. Well, the bride doesn't necessarily need a place to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> the horizontal distance between the foot of the slope and the top of the slope on either side. Is less than a yeah, that's how Which is impossible. Is. I mean, you're really, you're <coughs> virtually talking about a curtain when you're talking about that. 
אבל יש בשיפוע תפח, אבל אם יש תפח בנית סלופ, זה מבין, זה מבין, להחזיר את זה ולהחזיר את זה למשל. שיפוע אוהלים כאוהלים דמו, because the sleeping size of canopies are regarded as canopies. Okay, so that's their idea. Meaning that the slope is just like the horizontal. Velo amaran ela delo nachit mi puria tefach. And this was not said except where the bottom parts of the canopy do not extend the tefach below the bed. However, according to this, If part of the canopy descends to a hand breadth below the bed, it is prohibited. So if you look at this picture, it's just going to the side of the bed, right? right? But if it, But if it down, hangs down, you've then... You've got a problem. You've got a problem. Because I suppose you've actually made a tent. You've got walls on either side. You don't just have the slope. You've built something. Maybe the fact that it comes right down to the ground. Mm. Oh, except it never says... It, 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 it doesn't say that down to the ground. It doesn't say that, but it says that coming down the side of the bed, the tefah, makes it invalid. For use. That must be something like... Rashi has a very interesting mm. note on that. He says that it ends up that the bed itself forms the roof. That's logical. But then the bed becomes a roof for something. That's right. And the, the curtains become the wall. Yeah, the wall. Okay. Vama Rav Shesha Bereta Ravidi Hai Siana Share This felt hat, this strimal is permitted. A wide brim felt hat that was worn by travellers to protect them from the sun or rain. So, uh, what do they call them in Mexico? The sombrero. The sombrero. The ha'itmar siyana asur, but in a barayser it says a felt hat is prohibited. Lokashya ha de it be tefach This is where the brim is a tefach wide, hard to lay be tefach, and this is where it's not a tefach wide. Ella ma'ata sharbev biglima tefach. But now, if one were to extend your cloak a tefach, beyond the front of your head, okay, so you've got, your tef- you've got a tefach of a cloak Well, I mean, the talus, which you've got over your head. Yep. Hachinami Timichayev. Wouldn't this also render you liable? Good question. Because sometimes when I'm walking with my talit, and it's a really hot, sunny day, I put the talit over my head. To shave yourself. Sensible. Ela Lokasha. There's no difficulty. Ha Timihadak. This is where the hat is fitted tightly. Ha Delo Mihadak. This is where it's not fitted tightly, and therefore a loosely hat, worn hat could fall off. And you might ca- carry it. It's the same <coughs> problem with the woman with the gold thing on her head. Mm. She so. might end up carrying it, so you say you can't do it. Shalach le... Do you have a picture? No, no, no. no. Hat? But he- there's a note here. Do you want to say it? Uh, it is prohibited to wear a felt hat. It is prohibited, this is halakha, mm. on Shabbat, to wear a hat with a brim that is a hand breadth wide and is firm. This is the Magana Avraham. Even inside a house, because this act constitutes establishing a tent. The later commentaries discussed at length the hats worn in their times, some of which had brims that were wider than a hand breadth. And they raised several rationales to justify leniency in places where it was customary to wear them. 
So that, of course, fits nicely with people who wear those beautiful sable strobes that are wide. And it does suggest that I, I thought about it this morning. I mean, there are those who wear the wide strobes, then there are those who wear the high ones. That don't extend out of tefach, maybe. Mm. Okay. I think that may be the list. And uh, Jonathan um, Slotman was saying that he once was contacted by someone in Israel who asked him to get a hat for him to wear on Shabbat from Melbourne yeah. and bring it over. Mm-hmm. But we specified how wide the rim could be and how high it could be. And he and Jonathan thought this he would have been puzzled by it at the time he just did it. But this may be the basis for that person. That is very curious, Peter. So the, the the customary hat for like a hundred years mm. and it's also the fashion. But it, it now there's a, uh, there was a the Homburg that used to be worn quite there was regularly. Just mm. like the nice hats mm. with a thin brim around it and the back came up yep. a bit, right? And so that makes sense because it fits in with the not not a tefach mm. brim. And why, like the hat you're wearing, was never really in fashion. But then, well, we've got the Lubavitchers. The Lubavitchers wearing the Borsellinos. Mm. Maybe it was a statement to say you can wear a hat with a wide brim. Or, equally likely, the Rebbe's wearing one of those. Obviously. The Gadol is wearing But I've them. seen him wearing a, a, a narrow hat as well mm. in the in his younger days. Well, that was probably when he was following uh, uh, the previous Rebbe's custom. Well, the previous Rebbe wore a strimal. Did he? Yeah. On Shabbat? Yeah. That's interesting. That's right. I've seen photos of him. Yeah, you would have seen photos of him. Looking rather like... Um, Jeff Finch. Not that there's any big no, deal no. with wearing a, a strimal. That was also the done thing in Europe, and it was cold. Well, whatever. in certain areas it was done. Yeah, it was, it was done Russia. In Europe. And it was taken from the Polish nobility and the Russian nobility, that idea. So mm-hmm. I read you know, that every Jew was a prince. But that Borsellino certainly makes a halachic statement, which mm-hmm. I never considered. Should we keep going? Yeah. Interesting speculations. Okay. So, okay. not Shalach Shalach <coughs> We're up to Rami Bar Yechizkel. Yes, that's where we are. Shalach Rami Bar Yechizkel, Rav Huna. Eima lan izi hanach mile ma'al yata de amart lan mishme de rav. Tell us, my friend, those excellent teachings that you told us in the name of Rav. Tarte b'shabbat v'chada b'torah, two concerning Shabbat and one concerning the Torah itself. Okay, shalach le Rav Huna sent to Rami Bar Yechezkel. Had Tanya God bechisna mutar lintota b'shabbat concerning that which was taught in Brisa, it's permitted to hang a leather bag by its straps on Shabbat. Amar Rav. Uh, permits the mounting the leather bag by straps in its reserve spot for the night by fastening it in place with stakes. Uh, and he's got a side note, but finish reading this okay. bit. Sorry. Um, he's going to hang like leather bag by straps on Shabbat. Amarav, Loshan or Ella Bishne Bene Adam. This was taught only where... It was being hung by two people, but forbidden for a single person to hang it. Amar Abaye, but a canopy, canopy may not be spread out even by ten people. For it's impossible that even a small portion would not be spread properly. Idach Mahi. 
what's the other ruling? Detanya, kira shenish meta achat miyar choteha, an oven which had one of its legs broken off. Mutar letalzla, it's permitted to move it on Shabbos. Shtaim, if it had two uh, legs, if it lost two legs, asur, it's prohibited to move it. Since it is then a broken vessel. And, of course, ha- has ah, no use. Has no use, right. So it's Mugza. Ravamar, afilu chad nami asur, even if it just lost. One leg is prohibited. Gezerah shemayitka. This decree, lest one come to a fix it tightly, which would be building. Anyway, this sort of business about uh, the wine skin and the two people. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Rebbeinu Yona explains that tying a wineskin is prohibited when it is performed by one person because he ties it very slowly in a manner similar to building. On the other hand, when two people tie the wineskin in place together, the act is accomplished immediately. This is permitted because it is not similar to building, which is generally not accomplished all at once. Therefore, a canopy which cannot be immediately set in place even with the aid of several people, may not be spread even by ten people. Mm-hmm. I see. Torah. In regard to Torah, Damarav, Atida Torah She Tishtakach Misrael, the Torah will eventually be forgotten from Israel, Shinema, the Hifla Hashem et Makotecha, then Hashem will make extraordinary the Hifla. Your blows, is that the way it's translated there? And the Lord will make your plagues astonishing. And the plagues of your seed, great plagues of long continuance and evil diseases of long continuance. Hafla'a zo eni yode mahu. I do not know what is meant by hafla'a. Keshu omer, lachen hineni yosif le hafli et ha'am haze hafle. Vafile. When scripture states, what does it say with you, Peter? Therefore, behold, I will continue to astonish these people with wondrous astonishment, and the wisdom of its wise will be lost, and the understanding of its men of understanding shall be hidden. That's Isaiah. Have Omer Hafla'a Zotara. Say then that this is alluding to, Hafla'a is referring alluding to forgetting of Torah wisdom. Tan Rabbanan. Ke shinich nesu rabotinu lekerem biyavne amru. When our rabbis entered the vineyard in Yavne, they said, Atira Torah she tishtakach me Israel. The Torah will eventually be forgotten from Israel. Shnemar, hinei yamim ba'im na'um Hashem elokim v'hishlachi ra'av ba'aret. Behold, days are coming, declares Hashem, that I'll send a hunger into the land. Lo ra'av lelechem v'lotzam alamayim ki im lishma et tivrei Hashem. Not a hunger for bread, not a thirst for water, but to hear, uh, but that would be a hunger to hear the words of Hashem. Uchtiv, and the next verse says, Venau maim ad yam mitzafon vaad mizrach. And they shall journey from sea to sea and from north unto the east. Ye shotetu levakeshet devar Hashem veloyim tarof. They shall wander to seek the word of Hashem but shall not find it. Devar Hashem, the word of Hashem, zo halacha. Devar Hashem, ze haket words of Hashem, this refers to the end of exile. Va Hashem zo nevoah, this refers to prophecy. Omai yeshote tula vakesha dva Hashem, and what does it mean they shall wander to seek the word of Hashem? But uh, they will not find it. But they will 
down of Anna. Amra Tida Isha Shiti told Kikar Shal Truma. A woman will eventually take away Truma. Bet Tachazor Bebate Knesiot Uvebate Midrashot Leda Im Tmea. He the Im Tahorahi and bring it to the house of prayer and study holes to find out whether it's Tame or Tahor because she cooked it in a Tame oven. The Ain Mevin. And there will be no one who will understand, I assume, and also therefore be able to answer. In Tahora here, the in Tamea here, uh, whether the bread is Tamea or Tahor, the head yag tivbe, but it explicitly says, Mikol haochel ashayach yachel. It says explicitly in the Pasuk, which one? In Vaikra. From all foods which are eaten. It occurs on here, upon which water falls shall contract impurity, but all liquid drunk in any vessel shall contract impurity. It goes on, there can be no doubt as to the question of whether or not the loaf can become impure. Because it's written yeah, explicitly in the yeah, Torah. And it doesn't, it's not susceptible to being forgotten because it's there. Black and white. Um, so, so what does it mean? Does it mean that it can be eaten or can't be yes, eaten? Right, the Gemara explained. I'm just want to know. Does it? Um, does it, what does the pasuk say? Well, yeah. it goes on for a while, so you'll you'll find that this isn't really the question that was being asked. Okay. Anyway. Ella, by the way, we didn't get to this bit this morning. Any earthenware utensil into whose interior one of them, a dead sherds, will fall, everything in it shall become tummy. Yep. That's what's mentioned in this. Mm-hmm. But uh, it goes on a bit so okay. later. Ella leda im rishunahi ve im shniahi. Rather, whether um, the actual question is whether it is a first degree tumor or a second degree tumor, the aim of in and none will be there to understand or answer. Hanami must be in here, but that is also in a Mishnah. Kiditnan. That's a strange thing, because now that's oral for us. But it's but this is by this time it's written. I know, but but if it's referring to the time of the destruction of the Saint McDash, the Mishnah wasn't written. No. But I think this is being discussed by people after. When did Rebbe Yohorana see this? Two and a half years. So well, 130 odd years after. as we learned in the Mishnah, Hasheret Shinimsa Betanor, a sheret is found in an oven. Hapat Shabetachoshniya, the bread is second degree Toma. Shehatanor Tchila for the oven is first degree. Mistapka Lehu Hadama Le Rav Ada Barahava Le Rava, they'll be uncertain. Uh, that which Ravada Bar Ahava said to Rava, Lechzei hai tanura kamande male tuma, let us view this oven as though it is full of tuma. Betehevei pat rishona, and let the bread become first degree tuma. Scripture teaches that a, a sherit in the airspace of an earthenware vessel, such as an oven, renders the oven tame even if the sherets is not touching the inner walls of the oven. Ravada thus suggests, let us interpret this as implying that the sherets is viewed as if it fills the entire airspace and is touching the whole interior of the oven, thereby transmitting tumor to it. It would then follow that if the sherets is in an oven along with a loaf of bread, the sherets, the bread would also acquire first degree tumor just like the oven. For the primary tumor of the sherets is viewed as filling the space. That makes sense. Well, yep. that makes sense, okay. Um, uh, Amale. Amale. Rava said to Ravada Barahava, Lomrinan lechaze hai tanura kamand male tuma. We do not say that we view this oven as though it is full of tuma. Detanya, because we have in a brisa. Yachol yehu kolakilim mitamin ba'avir 
Kli Cheres, you might think that all utensils should contract Tumah in the airspace of an earthenware vessel. Talmud Lomar, Kol Hashabet Choyit Ma, Mikol HaOchel Ashayachel. So the Pasuk says, whatever is within it shall become Tameh. And the next verse says, from all food that is eaten. Is there an extension on that? There's an extension for a while. And any earthenware vessel in which any of them falls, all that is in it shall be impure. Mm -hmm. And you shall break it. All food that is eaten upon which water comes shall be impure, and all drink that may be drunk in any vessel shall be impure. Mm -hmm. The Baraisa learns from the juxtaposition of these verses that... Uh -huh. Foods. Foods contract tuma in the airspace of an earthenware vessel. Foods contract tuma in the The ankalim mitamin bavik klicheres. But utensils do not contract tuma in the airspace of an earthenware vessel. Uh, and he's added, apparently, the airspace of an oven is not considered filled with the impurity of the carcass of a creeping animal. If that were the case, even vessels would become ritually impure. Mm. So it's an argument against what the last one said. That's curious. So you can you can cook in a clear inside a tuma oven. Sounds like it. I suppose if you, if you were to stick a casserole, if you had no, nothing else to cook, so with. you can continue to use a tuma. Tummy oven. On, on the basis of this? Yeah. Because you can put more things into the room. Okay. It's curious. I suppose, you know, you're, you're getting ready for Shabbat. You find a sheriff who's got in there and died. Yeah. You've got to get the food done. Yeah. Okay. So, so what you do put you do? it in a sealed container. Put in a sealed shove container. It. Shove it. Yeah. I wonder if. The vessel can be, this new vessel can be, can be, um, earthenware. Oh, it's halakha at the bottom. Go ahead. The bread in a ritually impure oven. If the carcass of a creeping animal fell into the airspace of an oven, <coughs> the bread inside the oven assumed second degree ritual impurity status from the oven which assumed first-degree ritual impurity status from the creeping animal in its airspace, the Rambam, etc. Okay, yeah. Food become ritually impure in the airspace of earthenware vessels, but vessels do not become ritually impure in the airspace of earthenware vessels. Food and drink in the airspace of an earthenware vessel become ritually impure if the earthenware vessel became impure. Right. Even if the food and drink did not <coughs> come into contact with it. However, vessels in the airspace of an earthenware vessel do not become ritually impure. That's amazing. Tanya, who's taught in a Baraisa. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai Omer, Chas v'shalom she tishtakach Torah Israel. It doesn't require translation. Shneemar, ki lo tishakach for it says in the Pasuk in Tvarim. And I'll read the full quote here. Go ahead. And this song shall answer to him as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten from his seed. Ela ma'ani mekayem yeshotetu levakeshet devar Hashem velo yimtau. But how... Can I uphold the prophecy? What's the prophecy? They will run to find the word of God, but they will not find it. They shall run. They will not find it. Ah, good question. Shelo yimtzeu halacha brura mishnah brura b'makom echad. Clear halacha and clear teachings in any one place where they try to find it. And he's added, but rather there will be disputes among the sages. Ooh. I'm going to stop it.